Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm really delighted to be here. And what I'm gonna talk about today is the way that we try to integrate science and policy together um, at the Rudd Center where I work up the street. And I should mention the Rudd Center is technically in the psychology department, but our hearts belong in public health. Um, so our mission is to improve the world's diet, prevent obesity, and reduce weight stigma through creative connections between science and public policy. So that's the plan. And um, the way that we try to do this creative connection between science and public policy um, is in sort of looking at how research can both inform policy change and also tell us about what the effects of policies have been. So I was thinking about this, um, that right now I think a lot about research being done sort of before and after policy change. So before is kind of like your, so an example would be the IOM report on changing the WIC food package for women, which came out several years ago. Basically, a review of the literature and sort of consensus of the experts, and they come up with a report saying this is how we think this policy should change. The change takes place, and then afterwards, you can do research to test the implementation and the impact of the policy. So for example, we have a paper that we did here in Connecticut, a study of five towns, where we looked at what was being sold in small stores uh, that participated in WIC both before and after this policy change took place. And what we found, which was really encouraging, was that one of the effects of the, of the policy change was there was increased availability of all of the healthier foods. So it was easier to get low-fat dairy, whole grains, fruits and vegetables after the policy went into effect. And what was most interesting was even the non-WIC stores showed some of this improvement. So it really suggests that there was kind of a cultural shift in the food environments in those neighborhoods. But the type of research um, that I want to spend a little bit more time on instead of that sort of before and after is the studies that can be done during the process of policy change to really inform kind of the nitty gritty of how do you get these policies done. So first you need to really document why a specific policy is needed. Uh, there needs to be research on how to frame the message, how to communicate with people about why this policy is needed and why it's a good idea to do things this way. Then quickly, and this part actually won't, isn't so hard for you because everyone will point them out to you without you even asking, all the barriers, all the things that are going to get in the way of this policy and why it won't work. And you will also be told what the, quote, unexpected consequences. Those words invariably come up when you introduce a new policy. Um, people come up with ideas of how they think your policy could go wrong. And so a great strategy is to try to test for those up front so that you can really identify which, in fact, might be problems and which are really just, you know, things that, um, that it, it turns out really won't happen. So I'm going to use the example of food marketing to children and the work that the Rudd Center has been doing to kind of illustrate how we've done this. So we have a grant from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation uh, for five years to basically do work to reduce the harm of food marketing to children, which is kind of a big order. And the first thing that we've been doing is really documenting both the amount of food marketing that's directed at kids and the nutritional quality of the foods that are marketed to children. We also have done studies to test industry progress in self-regulation. So one of the things Dr. Dietz didn't mention today, but he did um, yesterday at his talk at the Rudd Center, was the involvement in the interagency working group, which was a government group to really try to put together recommendations for s nutrition standards and marketing standards for the food industry for marketing to children. The industry basically said, no, 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 you don't have to do that. We're going to self-regulate. Trust us. So we're <laughs> testing them. Um, we also are testing messages with parents because one of the really key groups, I think, to getting public support around these policies is getting parents upset. And amazingly, they aren't as upset as I think they should be. And so we've been trying to test out different ways of explaining the the problem to them and giving them different information and testing out to see what their reaction is. And then finally, the industry has all kinds of opinions and statements about why this isn't going to work, why they shouldn't be regulated, why their particular products are actually not so bad, and we can test those out as well. So for the first thing, what we've been doing for the past three years is um, taking one segment of the food industry each year and 
completely study and we purchase Nielsen data, we look at all of the marketing of products in that category to every age group, so kids, teenagers, and adults, and then we rate the nutritional quality of the products. So the first year we did cereal, the second year we did fast food, and then last year we did sugary drinks. So basically for cereal, there were, I don't know, about 100 different brands of cereal that were marketed on television in 2009. We took all of those brands and we scored them using a model from the UK called the Rainer Scale. Um, and we sort of started at the top with the best and went all the way down to the bottom with the worst. And then what we did is we looked to see how much are they marketed on television to children, how much are they marketed on the internet through what's called adver games, which if you're not familiar with them are these games that um, kids play so they feel like they're just sort of playing a game not participating in a commercial and they have characters that are actually from the product so that's another strategy and how much are kids going to other youth directed websites from that company to really try to promote the product so the best dozen which you may or may not recognize some of these names um, were are listed here and then we said okay well these are good products how much are they marketed to kids None. There was absolutely zero marketing spent on these products. So then we said, all right, well, let's look at the other side. The worst dozen, you probably recognize some of these. Um, and we said, OK, well, how much are those marketed to kids? Totally, this is where the action is. So essentially, what the cereal companies were doing, it's not that they don't know how to make healthy cereals. They do. But they were taking their worst cereals and marketing those to the youngest, you know, to the youngest children. So we basically went to them and we said, cereal companies, why are you doing this? You have healthy cereals. Why don't you market those to children? And they responded, actually General Mills and Cows responded in writing, and said a number of things, but included were food isn't nutrition until it's eaten. OK, hard to argue with that. And children won't eat low sugar cereals. So when I heard that, I thought, OK, that, that can't possibly be true. So we need to do a study and actually test that. So what we did was, and this is sort of was our first like strategic science study in the marketing areas. We basically went into a New Haven public school um, during the summer. It was a camp. We had about 100 kids. We randomly assigned them to two groups. And in one group, they got a choice of low sugar cereals, which were the ones down the left side. And the other group got a choice of the high sugar cereals. We also gave them milk, orange juice, cut up fruits, you know, uh, strawberry and banana. And then we actually gave them extra packets of sugar. Because another thing that a company had said is, the reason we add the sugar first in these pre-sweetened cereals is because if we didn't add the sugar, the kids would add more on their own. So we're helping you by putting in less sugar ahead of time. So we're like, fine, we'll, we'll get here. It's a big pile of packets of sugar. Let's see what these guys do. So first question, would they even eat the low sugar cereals? Like, would the kids who were randomized to that condition just flat out refuse to eat breakfast and say, no, I don't want any of this stuff? No, 0% of our children refused to take or eat. They all consumed some of the, sh of the cereal. Second, OK, well, let's, maybe they're just being polite. Why don't we ask them, how do you like it? So we could use this little rating scale. What we found was exactly the same in both groups. All of the kids either liked or loved the cereal. On average, no significant difference on their rating. So then we let them eat, and afterwards, we, our research assistant sat there with soggy cereal trying to sit there and weigh everything and measure everything. And basically, what we found, and the way that this is designed is, so the yellow are the grams that were consumed of the actual cereal minus the added sugar. So we sort of separated that out for this analysis. So we had younger kids and older kids separately, because younger kids eat more across the board. So we divided them up. We had, um, so you can see the, in the high sugar condition, they're eating a little over 30 grams of the cereal, and in the low sugar condition, about 25 grams. And then the red is the sugar in the cereal that they're consuming. So you can see how much more that is, obviously, in the high sugar condition. And then the black is the sugar from the packets that they added. So if, in fact, kids do add sugar from packets if you give it to them to low sugar cereal, but it still doesn't bring it up to the level of the high sugar cereal. In the older kids, it was the exact same pattern, only obviously more pronounced because they ate more cereal. So it's interesting because if you think back to what the company said, they said they won't eat low sugar cereals. Well, if you're in the business of selling cereal and you sell a product where people eat twice as much of that product per sitting, then I guess from your perspective, that's a problem. But if you're really trying to get kids to eat a recommended serving size of the product, which is 30 grams, Clearly, the kids in the low sugar condition are eating. They are eating the recommended serving size or a little bit above of the cereal. 
the kids in the high sugar condition are eating twice as much in some cases. So really the answer is they will eat it, they just won't eat twice as much as they're supposed to, which is clearly a problem if you're selling it but not a problem if you're the mother. So sort of bottom line, it was 24 grams of refined sugar versus 13 between the two groups. The calories, interestingly, were not that different. Now, I was thinking about um, the comment earlier about the energy gap and sort of where do we put the energy gap. This was not a statistically significant difference. The high sugar group had 383 calories on average, low sugar 345. But it would be interesting to look at other studies and see if that's actually a reliable finding because that could be a nice little calorie savings right right there at breakfast that I think could help contribute to the solution. Um, comparable milk consumption, interestingly, so they put about the same amount of milk on. And interestingly, the way that the kids in the low sugar condition compensated for the lower calories is they added more fruit to their cereal. So only 8% of kids in high sugar put fruit on their cereal, 54% in the low sugar. So in my mind, that's a win-win. So they're getting the fresh fruit with the fiber and you know all the positive attributes of that and not this sort of added um, pre-sweetened sugar. Okay, so that was one study. So I'm just gonna give you a quick other example. So the second year we did Okay, so the second year we did um, fast food, and we, um, we actually talk to these companies. We invite them, you know, to the Red Center, and they come and sit down in our conference room. And so we were talking to McDonald's, and we said to them, you know, you have healthy options for your kids' meals. Um, why don't you make those the default? And they first said, we don't have, this is, I have to say, this was two years ago. We do not have a, a default Happy Meal. Um, and yet, and we offer choices, we're all about choice, we offer choices to everyone that includes milk, juice, and apple dippers. Now, I happen to know from personal experience, when apple dippers first came out, I was on the road on 95, I will admit it, I feel like, I, you know, if I don't tell you guys, someone's gonna see me doing this. I went to the McDonald's drive-thru with my kids, it was raining, and I said, fine, we'll go, we'll get a Happy Meal, we'll get the apple dippers. So I specifically said I would like the apple dippers. I get the Happy Meal, I look inside, and what's in it? The apple dippers and the french fries. So I'm sure I'm the only person who's ever done this. I pull over, I park, I get out of the car, go in with my kids, and complain. I didn't ask for these french fries, I asked for the apple dippers, and they were baffled, like wh why is that a problem? You just got free food. So clearly the communication down to the staff at McDonald's was not really happening. But I knew that they automatically put the fries in. I just ha had heard that from many people and people didn't even realize they had a choice. So what we did was a study in 2010 where we basically sent people out to um, 250 restaurants around the country, it was a national sample, we went to 50 of each of these top five restaurants. We had them basically order the kids meal and not say anything specific to see what the default was and track if the side and the beverage were provided automatically. So basically what was happening the majority of the time, especially in McDonald's Burger King, was that they were automatically putting the fries in. They weren't even mentioning anything about a fruit side and they were automatically assuming that you wanted the soda. They weren't mentioning that they had milk or juice as an option. I should point out Subway is the exception. They do things differently there. So basically the point here is that we were then able with these data to go back to the industry and say, actually, you know, no, you really do have a default and you need to change your default. About, I'd say 10 months after this came out, McDonald's did actually change their default, although it was kind of sneaky. What they did is they changed it, so now it's half french fries, half apple dippers. <laughs> I mean, it's like a roar shock if you're an optimist or a pessimist, how you react to that. So basically, it's better than it was, but it's certainly not as good as we wanted, but that's the new default. If you guys go to McDonald's, you know what to expect. So finally, um, the CFBAI is the Child Food and Beverage Advertising Initiative, which is the self-regulatory body for the food industry that has really been in place for a few years trying to stop any kind of government regulation saying we can do this. So this is the sort of thing they say, and I'm not gonna give it away, but we will have a study coming out in June on how they're doing on that. <laughs> so basically, to summarize, when you're trying to pass a controversial policy, you need to know who the opposition is. For us, it seems to often be the food industry, but it can very well be other people. It can be parents who are mad that they want to do fundraising in your school, or it can be preschool teachers who really feel that kids should be allowed to have birthday cupcakes. You need to understand it, and then my advice is don't get mad, get data, try to do a study, try to figure out you know, if the things that they're worried are gonna happen actually do happen. 
And we use the media a lot to influence public opinion. When we have studies come out, we really try to get the word out. We work a lot with the communications um, people at Yale because we really feel like, you know, like Jeanette sort of said, you publish a study in an academic journal, you know, a few people read it, you get on Good Morning America and people pay attention. So that's something that we've really tried to use strategically. And then finally, don't give up. It takes a long time. So here's just finish here's information. Everything's on our website. Thank you.